Uh, I want to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Uh, David Bebbington, who uh, has been a longtime faculty member at the University of Stirling in uh, Scotland. Uh, he's uh, lectured and taught in many locations. Uh, most recently, he's been uh, a part of the doctoral program in history at Baylor University uh, since 2003 and has helped to establish the program there. And we've been very fortunate that uh, David, while he's been coming to the States uh, every other year, has been willing to come to OBU. He's been a very good friend to Oklahoma Baptist University. And uh, I know our history students have benefited especially from having him come. This is his fifth time to come to uh, OBU. And uh, so our students here have uh, had him more or less as a regular instructor. Uh, every other year, of course, but when David comes, he spends um, uh, uh, a number of days here and spends a lot of time and effort uh, in helping us to better understand our own history. Uh, David's area of expertise is uh, evangelicalism, nonconformity in Britain, and the history of Baptist. And in fact, uh, our Baptist history and theology course here uses the textbook that uh, he wrote just a couple of years ago. And so we're really fortunate to have uh, him here to talk about uh, that. You will have an opportunity to hear David on some other occasions, and uh, you'll see that information posted around uh, campus, and I hope you'll take the opportunity to hear him. Uh, I want to just say a word, too, about uh, David as a Christian, if I can say that. Uh, he is a fine example of what it means to be a professional a professional historian in this case, which I can appreciate because that's my own field, but also to be um, a follower of Christ. And sometimes we think of those things as being uh, separate. It's one of the things we try not to do. We try to integrate our lives. Um, but I think we all know that it's a challenge to integrate our profession with our faith at all times. And that's one of the things that uh, I've always appreciated about uh, David is that he uh, so gracefully and easily integrates his faith and learning. And as many of you know, uh, in many academic disciplines, uh, faith is often seen as something that needs to be kept at a distance. And one of the things David uh, did right from the beginning of his career, uh, the very first book he published uh, called Patterns in History, uh, was in fact a, a working out from a professional point of view of what it means to have a Christian mind in approaching the study of history. And uh, I think it was uh, brilliant. I don't know if he planned it this way, but to make that your initial statement of your career and then to live that out now across uh, many decades, um, I think is a real testament to uh, his conviction it's a testament to uh, the power of Christ in his life and um, what that's meant and how it's made a difference in his career, in his life. So uh, with that, I hope you will uh, welcome uh, David Bebbington. He'll be uh, speaking on um, uh, one of the parables today uh, in the series uh, from, uh, that you'll be listening to for the whole semester. Um, so please welcome David Bebbington. Good morning. Let me say a thank you for the invitation to come this morning, as well as to John for his introduction. I'm always very glad to come to OBU. I always pe think people are very nice here. And my granddaughter thinks that too. She first came when she was only one and a half. And one of her favorite pictures is of her, aged one and a half, stroking the nose of the bison in your oval. And she really likes that and often turns to it in the family photo album. So we all have happy memories of OBU. I'm very glad to be here again. Subject this morning is the parable of the mustard seed. If you have a Bible, you might like to turn to Luke chapter 13, verses 18 and 19, which I will now read. Luke chapter 13, verses 18 and 19. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? 
what shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. We thank God for those two verses from his word. I'd like to talk about those two verses now. I'd like to begin by simply remarking that my own church, Stirling Baptist Church in the centre of Scotland, occupies a building which is a former Free Church of Scotland built in 1853, one of the largest Presbyterian church buildings in the town originally. And in the vestry, there is a plaque. It says that a very large contribution was made to the building of that structure by William Drummond, an elder of the church, who was also a seedsman. William Drummond made a fortune by selling seed, seed for agriculture. Seed very much like the seed that is talked about in this passage. So because of that plaque, I have long had a rather special interest in this particular story. Seed can go a long way, indeed. The nephew of William Drummond, the man I mentioned, Henry Drummond, wrote a remarkable book in 1883 called Natural Law in the Spiritual World, which was hugely successful in the States as well as in Britain, in which he drew lessons from nature, from things like seeds, about God's dealings with human beings, stressing the need for conversion. The Drummond family then was special to my church, but points out the importance of seed. This parable is fascinating for that reason. I'd like to go through it point by point this morning. So I begin. Firstly, questions. If you look at this passage, it begins with the three words, then Jesus asked. He put questions to the crowds. Rhetorical questions, not expecting an immediate answer. What is the kingdom of God like, he asks. What shall I compare it to? Now let's linger, first of all, about Jesus' method here. He is using a technique which had been used by Socrates in 5th century Athens. Socrates used that method to teach philosophy, not by long statements of what he believed to be true, but by brief, pungent questions put to those who were his disciples. That is Socratic method, as it's often called. Very effective for teaching because it requires the hearers not just to listen, but to think. When you're asked a question, you have to think through what the right answer is. Socrates used that method. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's making his disciples wrestle through the issues that he's raising so that they would learn and internalize. And Jesus does the same to us in the 21st century. We want to learn more about the Christian faith. We want to learn more about our duties. We want to learn more about our opportunities for service. How do we find out? Well, I think we have to listen to the questions Jesus asks. He asks us questions through scriptures again and again and again. We sometimes gloss over the difficult bits in the Bible which pose questions to us, but I don't think we should because they're designed to make us think. A passage may pose a very serious problem. Think, for example, of the passages in the book of Psalms where the psalmist cries out for vengeance against his enemies. How does that fit the peaceable teaching of Jesus himself? It's difficult. It needs thinking through. Happily, C.S. Lewis, that great Christian teacher of the last century, has very wise words on that subject in reflections on the Psalms. But we have to think through the issue for ourselves. How do the Psalms fit with what Jesus has to say, exemplify, and teach? The Bible then gives us lots and lots of questions. Questions that we have to think through, consider, ponder, perhaps for a long time. We don't just get answers from the Bible. We find questions to challenge us. Christians, I sometimes think, should be like cows. Christians should be like cows 
because we have to ruminate. We have to chew the cud. We have to think through issues. We have not just to take in a morsel of scripture, but we have to chew it meditatively. Do you make a habit of thinking through how the Bible challenges you with slow reflection? It's worthwhile. The answers when we eventually reach them are all the more deep-seated because we've found them for ourselves. So the first thing is Jesus' method, he asks questions. Let's consider questions that the Christian faith in all its dimensions poses to us. Secondly, the kingdom. Jesus asks, what is the kingdom of God like? Now, the content of his questions is entirely about the kingdom of God, so we do well to explore what he meant by that idea. It was the burden of Jesus' preaching. You'll remember at the start of Mark's gospel, it says that he came preaching that the kingdom of God is near, chapter 1, verse 15. Now, what is this kingdom? It's not territory. Kingdom, most obviously, would be territory, an, an area of a state bounded by an actual boundary. But that's not what the kingdom of God is. It's not a mere area of land. Nor, intriguingly, is it a republic. Now, republics have certain merits, I believe, as systems of human government. But notice that the kingdom of God is actually a monarchy which I, coming from my side of the Atlantic, find slightly reassuring. It is a kingdom. The cosmos has a king, a ruler. What type of kingdom is it, though? It doesn't answer the question simply to say it's not a republic. It's not a new social order, either. At the start of the 20th century, Walter Rauschenbusch, a very eminent Baptist theologian, taught the kingdom of God is the key message of Jesus. Now, on that, he's right. But he saw the kingdom of God simply as a new social order with limits on capitalism and the spirit of brotherhood animating all peoples. He was the leading theologian of the social gospel. Now, he was still an evangelical in many ways, believing in personal conversion. But he saw the kingdom of God in the New Testament as merely a new form of society. And it's not just that. It's far more. What is it? The kingdom of God is wherever God rules, wherever God rules, where his reign is exercised, where he by his spirit is in charge. And rule, I think, is a much better word than kingdom for understanding what Jesus means, a useful translation, I think. So where is the rule of God? In one sense, it's in the future. It's in the future reign when God will be all in all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24 says that at the end of time, Jesus will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. So this is an eschatological concept in the theologian's language. It's about the perfect state of affairs at the end of time when history is over. God will rule absolutely. But what about the present? God's reign has already appeared. Jesus came to proclaim and to embody the kingdom. Luke chapter 10 verse 9 says that the kingdom is near. Why? Because Jesus is present. Wherever Jesus is in charge, there God's reign is already realized in the affairs of history. But we have to be even more precise. When Jesus was asked himself when the kingdom was, would come, and that's in Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. He said that the kingdom is within you, inside you. The kingdom is internalized. God can reign in your hearts, as we sometimes say. He's saying the kingdom is not really visible, but an interior affair. When Jesus reigns in the heart, then we say we are Christians, and that is right. And that is the kernel of the kingdom. The heart of the kingdom, the place where God rules, is where Jesus is fully acknowledged as Lord. And we have to enter that kingdom. And that is the truth of the gospel message. We enter the kingdom by trusting Jesus for ourselves personally, by accepting the salvation that he achieved for us on the cross. And so, 
The second point that we need to learn in this passage, I think, is that the kingdom of God needs to be understood. And more importantly, we have to enter that kingdom of God ourselves, making God our king by trusting in his son. Thirdly, comparison. You'll see that the two questions are about comparison. A description, you see, of the kingdom that goes through all its details is impossible. If it's partly internal, as Jesus has said, you can't describe what it is fully. We cannot provide a technical blueprint of the kingdom of God. What is possible is the language of metaphor, saying what the kingdom is like, which is what Jesus does. He says, what is the kingdom like, quite explicitly? What shall we compare it to? Now, comparisons, picture language, metaphors, are full, full in the Bible. It's stuffed with them. Let me illustrate that from Ezekiel, a passage that you might just possibly like to turn to if you have your Bibles in chapter 17. There is a very long picture there of a vine representing Judah and its king with two eagles representing Babylon and Egypt struggling over this vine. It's about power politics, but in terms of pictures. Then verse 22 in that passage, a passage very similar to our own from Luke, homes in on a detail. It says, God will plant a sprig of a cedar tree. In verse 23, that will produce branches and become a fine tree, and then the birds will shelter in the shade of those branches. Here is a promise in Ezekiel chapter 17 of a new king who will reestablish Judah. And that was to happen with Zerubbabel, according to the book of Nehemiah. But the message in Ezekiel is through the picture language of trees and branches and birds, just as we have pictures of trees and branches and birds in our passage. What does that have to say to us? Do not expect the Bible normally to yield science-like accounts of things. The Bible contains poetry. The Bible contains poetic prose. The Bible contains comparisons. Expect the Bible to contain symbols, images. After all, you have your bison. Why shouldn't the Bible writers have their symbols? I quite like a story which shows the way that we should not use the Bible, the wooden way that ignores all these symbols. It's the story of an individual seeking guidance from Scripture who believed in opening it at random and seeing what passage his eyes glanced upon. He opened the Bible and he found the passage, and Judas went and hanged himself. He then opened the Bible again and read another passage, Go thou and do likewise. That is not the way to use the Bible. It can be very dangerous. What we should do is we should relish the comparisons, the symbols, the metaphors, internalize them, appreciate the metaphors of Scripture, and derive the full teaching that those pages have to offer us. And so, fourthly, we go on to do that with this passage. Seed is spoken of, seed. The kingdom of God is compared to a mustard seed. That is probably the black mustard, which is very common around the Sea of Galilee. It is the smallest of seeds, we're told in the parallel passage in Mark, chapter 4, verse 31. It's a tiny object. And it's a much more surprising item to home in on the natural world than the twig of the cedar tree in that passage from Ezekiel we've just looked at. That clearly has potential. A twig of a tree can grow, but a mustard seed, something so small, can it grow? It's so different from what we think of as the kingdom of God. Herschel Hobbes, the greatest of Oklahoma Baptists, once commented that Jesus's adversaries thought that the kingdom of God consisted of outward splendor 
and a share of worldly greatness. And he was right. But Jesus, by contrast, points out the kingdom is like the obscurest, the tiniest of seeds. And that is because of the potential of the small. Even the tiniest thing can become significant in creating the kingdom of God. For example, in 1973, the economist E.F. Schumacher wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. Rightly appreciated by many Christians, that book insisted that economics should be about people, not just about big corporations. And surely that is right. It is sound to that extent that small is beautiful. Even in economics, you have to think about people. We surely should take on principle that the small can be beautiful, can be creative. Even tiny gestures can be really important. For example, smiling when you pass a stranger. And the nice thing is, I know from personal experience on previous visits, that that is very common on this campus. It really helps. It can lift the spirits. Please carry on doing that. Students are very good at it, but stick at it. Smile when you pass a stranger, because that is communicating a tiny bit, a mustard seed type element of what God's rule is like, because he makes people joyful within and want to communicate that joy. Value the small. Appreciate what is tiny. Give what is tiny, because it can be multiplied a thousandfold. So, says Jesus, the kingdom is like a mustard seed. The tiny has great potential. Fifthly, purpose. Does the seed automatically fulfill its potential? No, of course it doesn't. You can't leave seed in packets as bought from seedsmen like William Drummond's and expect it to grow. When it's in the packet, it won't. It's designed for agricultural use. A farmer must take out the seed and sow it. He must take up the act of cultivation. There must be human purpose behind the use of seed. So here, did it strike you when we looked at the passage a moment ago that the man takes the seed. The word take is used. In the past, a man took the seed. The word plant is used. The man planted the seed. And he didn't just plant it anywhere. He planted it in his garden. So there is taking a deliberate act, planting it, placing the seed where he wanted it, and in a garden where it's protected so it can grow safely. Here is intentional activity, purpose. We need to adopt the same policy if we want the rule of God to be extended in our own lives and in the lives of others. We cannot sit back and expect the kingdom to arrive spontaneously. For ourselves, we need to seek personal holiness, and that may entail sacrifice, and we must be prepared intentionally, deliberately, to sacrifice something if it stands in the way of our growth in grace. For example, it may mean total abstinence from liquor. That has commonly been a Baptist stance in the past, and there is very good reason for it. And we should choose to do that if we believe it to be God's will for us in order to deny ourselves to grow in grace. And yet equally, we don't just want to develop our own personal holiness. Equally, we want to engage with the world to see the, the advance of the kingdom amongst other people. Have you considered doing something you'd probably really enjoy, some of you? Joining a car club, partly with the purpose of getting to know friends with the common interest of vehicles, so that we can spread the gospel among them. If you like cars and the gospel, it's a powerful combination. So, why not seek holiness? Why not seek holy worldliness for the sake of the gospel with the intention of advancing God's rule? Our purpose must be explicit. We must be clear about our aim. And our aim is the advance of the kingdom of God. 
Sixthly, growth. We are told that the seed grew and became a tree. The mustard plant in Galilee can grow to around 10 feet tall, much bigger than a human being. Indeed, according to Mark chapter 4, verse 23, it grows to become the largest of garden plants. And it's surprising that a minuscule seed can grow that big. That is not our doing. That is not the achievement of the farmer. Someone else is at work in making the tiny become big. God gives the growth to the mustard seed, not us. God acts. It's exactly the same in the parable in Ezekiel chapter 17 we looked at. Verse 24 stresses that it's God who brings down tall trees and God who raises low trees. God gives growth, the principle affirmed elsewhere in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6, another passage about seed says that the apostle Paul planted, the apostle Apollos watered, but God made it grow. God's, God is the one, the Almighty is the one who makes seeds develop into magnificent trees, the trees of the kingdom. And that's very evident in Christian history. The Baptist Missionary Society, the start of the modern Anglo-American missionary movement, was begun by William Carey in 1792, a, sh a poor shoemaker by background, an obscure man, very humble origins. He went to India to preach the gospel. He had no converts at all. Nobody became a Christian for seven whole years. His whole effort seemed to be pointless, but he persevered, and from those tiny beginnings, sprang other missionary agencies copying him in America as well as in Britain, and the gospel was taken to many other parts of Asia, then Africa and Latin America, and many other lands. Something that was so tiny and appeared to be a disaster at the start, developed into something huge, and Carey had a motto. His motto was this, expect great things, attempt great things. Expect great things, attempt great things. And the attempt to do great things with small resources is possible only in expectation of the blessing of Almighty God. We look to God to give the growth. Let's never suppose we can achieve everything by ourselves. He alone gives the increase. And seventhly, the outcome. Eventually, says our passage, the birds of the air perched in the branches of the tree. The mustard tree is strong enough for birds to roost there. Picture is very familiar to me as I walk to work every day at Stirling. I go along a road where in the evening the trees, tall trees, are full of crows, make an enormous noise, cawing. But they're very content. They're obviously very happy in their trees, just as these birds are very happy to be perched in the mustard tree. They find shelter in the tree, just as in Ezekiel's image, birds find shelter. What are these birds? In Jewish stories of the time, we know that birds in trees are identified as the nations of the world. And so here, I think the idea is that different nations, different peoples, all find shelter in the one tree of the kingdom of God. All nations are brought under the rule of God. The kingdom of God has grown so large that it embraces the world. That is the outcome of the growth of God's rule. It has an astonishing outcome. In this connection, think of the striking statement of the Lord himself in John chapter 14, verse 21. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I do. And even more astonishing, he will do even greater things than these. Can a believer do greater things than the Lord Jesus Christ? It is the strange and astonishing thing to be saying. But Jesus said it. So what did he mean? William Temple, a former Archbishop of 
of Canterbury pointed out point, the meaning of that verse, I think. He pointed out that Jesus, when on earth, was limited to a human body. He could only be in one place at once. But his followers can spread out over the whole earth and can achieve more, therefore, in a sense, in his name. Christians, for example, says Temple, have built hospitals in many lands, actually doing greater things than just healing people one by one, as Jesus did one on earth. And so the Christian faith, the followers of Jesus, have extended the rule of God. That is the outcome. The kingdom of God has become life-enhancing to millions. Many of all nations have found shelter under its branches. So we see that the outcome is immense. The blessings of God's rule are widespread. That, I think, is what the parable of the mustard seed has to say to us. You'll recall that at the start I mentioned William R Drummond, a sterling seedsman. He prospered at his seed-selling job, but I didn't tell you what else he did. He founded the Drummond Tract Enterprise for printing little booklets, tracts, commending the Christian faith. It started as a tiny venture, just printing one tract, then another, months apart. But eventually, he published millions of tracts, and his organization carried on long after his death. That Drummond tract enterprise was the means by which many people heard of the gospel and responded to Jesus. And that is an instance of this parable, a tiny venture from a seedsman becoming an immense venture in advancing the rule of God. And so, what have we learned from this parable? Firstly, questions. We are to consider all the questions that the scriptures pose to us. Secondly, the kingdom. We have to enter the kingdom of God for ourselves. Thirdly, comparison. We need to appreciate the metaphors of scripture. Fourthly, seed. Tiny things have great potential. Fifthly, purpose. We need to aim to advance the rule of God. Sixthly, growth, but it is God who gives the increase. And seventhly, outcome, the blessings of God's rule become immense. We thank God that his rule grows from a tiny seed to a vast tree. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus' teaching. We thank you that it has inspired millions over the centuries. And we thank you especially for this teaching. We thank you for small beginnings. And we thank you that we, in our small corner, can plant tiny seeds. Show us which seeds to plant, we pray you, this day, during the coming week, during our whole lives. Show us how to plant them. Show us how to be diligent in planting seeds, but help us then to behold with awe and wonder the giving of the increase by our God. Let us admire your handiwork in bringing great trees out of the tiny seeds that we and others plant. And let us admire the way in which the birds of the nations come and roost in the tree of the kingdom. We pray for the advance of that kingdom, our Father, we pray that more and more human beings may be wholly subject to the rule of Jesus Christ. And we ask that we may play our part in coming years in that great commission with which you have entrusted us. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.